All right, our next speaker is Zachary Page with uh, Critical Magic. Zachary Page has traveled all over the Midwest performing magic and mental demonstrations for corporate, for corporate and professional audiences for the past 15 years. Using a combination of sleight of hand, theatrical, and psychological tools, Zachary works in cooperation with his audiences to create a powerful psychic illusion that may be experienced to be believed. While pursuing an education in psychology and philosophy at the University of Northern Iowa, Zachary has begun lecturing on the role of critical and creative thinking play in the performance art of magic. By synthesizing philosophical and scientific understanding with his experiences as a corporate mentalist, Zachary hopes to impassion others to become more sophisticated critical thinkers and open them to a world rarely discussed due to strict code of secrecy. Please join me in welcoming Zachary Page. I'm a student here at the university, and what I would like to do is go through a series of experiments with you to sort of test the bounds of skepticism. When I was asked to present here today, I was really just kind of racked my brain to decide what really can a magician contribute that you might not be able to experience with some of the other brilliant lectures that we've got planned all week long. Um, and what I really came across very quickly was just the Webster's Dictionary definition of of what skepticism is. And what they talk about, aside from the scholarly use of the term, is that skepticism is really systematic doubt. So I thought that was a really great way to link skepticism with magic because I really think that magic and mentalism in particular offers a great way of showing you just how systematic you ought to doubt things and just the level that that, that the depth that that doubt should be. So with that sort of premise for the for the show, I'd like to do about a half hour, 45 minute magic show for you guys, and then have a little Q&A session where we can talk about some of the effects afterwards. Does that sound fantastic? Yeah. Okay, so as I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop this. I don't wanna kill the battery. Turn it off. Um, usually I like to kinda get the crowd warmed up a little bit and try a little sort of practice demonstration that I use to kind of get my head in the game for a magic show. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to show you a little uh, sort of uh, mental gymnastics that you can kind of do with the deck of cards. Now, um, what I might do is just kind of hold these out so that people can kind of shuffle them a little bit, if that's okay. Would you go ahead and shuffle those? Kind of make some? Go ahead and shuffle those. Perfect. Would you do me a favor and just kind of give those a shuffle? Can you go ahead and go ahead and shuffle those a little bit? I know, sorry, I'm going to put your coffee down. <laughs> now, while they're doing that, in a moment, I'm going to collect these cards, and as rapidly as I can, I'm going to try to memorize the order of the entire, the entire deck of cards. Now, I know that sort of sounds like a very grand feat, but there's a trick, uh, believe it or not, called the mind. And you can actually memorize a list of words for each number, up until as high as you want to go, we all remember the one bun, two shoe, three tree from grade school. Well, you can memorize that out as far as you'd like. And that allows you to organize long chains of anything, really, and help you memorize it. So now, could you hand those to her and let her shuffle those together? And could you, one of you hand the other one to the other one and give them a nice shuffle? That's perfect. Oh, no, sorry, together. Uh, you do it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, confident with that? All mixed. Well, Nick. Perfect. Now, would you two mind helping me up on stage? Come on up here. And you, would you mind helping me out? Yeah. Yes, give a nice big hand of applause. Give them a <laughs> That's perfect. Oh, we'll move a little bit to the side. That's camera. Okay. Now, in a moment, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to try to memorize this entire deck of cards as quickly as I can. Do you know how to, how to read a watch? Would you mind timing me? Yeah. You have one on yours? Okay. Well, we would kind of wait till it gets to the uh, wait till it gets around to the top, uh, or, or to an easily recognized number, and then you tell me to go, and then I'm going to try to run through the cards as fast as I can. It shouldn't take longer, hour to our tops. Okay? <laughs> 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 okay, are you ready? On your mark, tell me when to go. Let me go.
and done. Okay, how, how, how long was that? Around 23 seconds. 23 seconds? Okay, I think that's pretty fast. Okay, would you believe if I told you I cheated a little bit? You probably would. Okay, what, what I actually did, I'll let you take half the cards, and I'll let you take half the cards. Go ahead and stand a little bit further apart, that's perfect. Um, let me explain. Really, what's only, it's only really necessary to memorize half the cards in a deck of cards. I know there's 52, so if I memorize the first 26, I know by process of elimination that if you've got those 26 cards, by definition, she must have the other 26 cards. Does that make sense? Okay, so why don't you do me a favor quick and pull the clubs to the front. Now here's what happens. Each one of the cards is associated with a different picture. And I have for the ace of clubs, it's a long club with two clubs on either end. And if I saw that card in his half, I broke that image. A broken image indicates to me that I saw that particular image and that it would be in his half of the deck. If, however, I think of the picture associated with the card and it is not broken, it is unmolested as they say, then it would be in her side. Okay? So first example for this is the club, it is broken, you have the ace of clubs. Okay? So if, if I'm correct, go ahead and just drop the ace of clubs to the ground. Okay, perfect. And that will signify that I've got it. Now, the two of clubs for me is actually cross clubs, and they have been, they, they have, they're straight up and down. You've got the two of clubs, is that correct? Go ahead and drop it if you've got the two of clubs. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you familiar with the faces of the cards? Or is that harder for you? Would you like to? That's okay, that's okay. I should have checked that beforehand. That's right. You go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much for helping me out. Is there anyone who's much more familiar with this deck of cards that might like to help me out? Would you like to help me out? Perfect. Thanks. Give her a round of applause. Help her out. <laughs> we'll say that that's okay. If you can go through, go ahead and just take the club and bring them to the front, okay? I don't want to see any more than I already have, okay? You bring them to the front. Now, you have the ace of clubs. That's correct, okay? So then... The two of clubs. That's okay. That's all right. We got. I've got two hours. It's fine. <laughs> we got two hands. Okay, you got the clubs. Yeah. That's perfect. Now you have the two of clubs and the three of clubs. I promise it will get faster as we go, folks. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and drop those on the ground. Perfect. Now, you have the four of clubs, the five of clubs is broken, and the six of clubs. Okay, now you have the seven of clubs. No. You sure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. I thought, oh no, it's falling apart around me. Okay, you've got the seven of clubs. That means you've got the eight of clubs, the nine of clubs, you've got the ten of clubs, the yes. jack of clubs, yes. and the queen of clubs. Yes. John, finish out with the king of clubs. Oh, okay. <laughs> we move right along here. Can you go ahead and find the hearts? Let's do some red cards. Find the hearts. Can you bring them to the front? If you're watching, the cards are separating themselves as we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you hey, that's part of the card toy. That's all right. That's all right. You, you, it's back to my fire. It's all. <laughs> Whatever you say. <laughs> now, you've got the hearts, correct? Correct. Now, I believe you have the ace of hearts and the two of hearts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the three of hearts, the four of hearts. No. Five, no, sorry, you have the five of hearts, the six of hearts, and the seven of hearts. Is that correct? Uh, John, the uh, eight of hearts. Um, over here, man, you've got the nine of hearts and the ten of hearts. Right. The jack of hearts, queen of hearts. And John has the king of hearts. Oh, no. <laughs> Now, let's do the, let's do black things. Just fade card, get fade left in your hand. Separate red and black, otherwise. Might help. Okay. The diamonds, correct? Fade. Ah, uh, it was a trick. Fade, <laughs> fade. Woo, it's too late, it's too early in the day to do that. You've got the spades, correct? Yes. Okay, okay, okay.
Ma'am, you have the ace of spades. Yes. The two of spades. Yes. And the three of spades. Yes. You've got the four of spades, the five of spades. Ma'am, you have the six, seven, and the eight. Is that correct? Yes. Spades, go ahead and drop those. Nine of spades. Ten of spades. Jack of spades. Over here, ma'am. Ten and jack of spades. Yes. John, you have the queen and king. Finish off that suit. Hopefully, all we have are diamonds, correct? We've got some diamonds in our hands now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the Joker. Yes, of course you can discard that. Okay. Let's go. We got this. We're going we're to close this, folks. I promise. Um, you have the ace of diamonds. Yes. John, you have two of diamonds, three of diamonds, four of diamonds. Mm -hmm. Five of diamonds. Six of diamonds. Yes. Seven of diamonds. Eight of diamonds. Nine of diamonds. And ten of diamonds. Yes. Jack of diamonds. Queen of diamonds. And you've got the king of diamonds to finish this out. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give them all the round of applause once again for all the we do that as a warm up, really get the really get the crowd warmed up a little bit. And what I found is after I kind of get in sync a little bit and really start get going, um, you know, a lot of people just want to say, read my mind, tell me what you're thinking, right? You see that on TV shows all the time where they just come up and they'll reveal some bizarre information. And what I found is that's actually not really possible. However, if you give people a small set of things on which to concentrate, you can oftentimes make some very staggering predictions. And so I'd like to do uh, another demonstration right now. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll try it again. Yes, hooray! <laughs> it's going fantastic. Now I have a small <laughs> set of envelopes here, okay? Uh, one, one is blue, one is red, one is yellow, okay? Now in each side is a piece of paper on which I have written a truly staggering prediction, I assure you. Okay, now I'm going to need some volunteers from the audience, so be, uh, go ahead and just keep, stay where you're sitting. I'll just sort of call you out. I already see we have hands shooting up across. There's a sea of hands. Okay, you, sir. Uh, I, have the, I have yellow, red, and blue. Please clear your mind and name any color now. Blue. Blue. Now that was the one I had directly on the, on the front. Was that influencing you in any way, Jimmy? No, I, I have my... Have your iPhone. Yeah. Okay, now you'll notice, go ahead, there's a piece of paper inside there. Go ahead and take that. Okay. And you can see there's nothing else in the envelope. All right. Okay. Um, now, don't open it just yet. Okay. Dramatic buildup. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I have two envelopes yet left. Someone from this side, please. Would you like to help me out? Again, remain seated. I have uh, a yellow and a red envelope. Please, I would like you to clear your mind, and then as soon as I snap my fingers, name one of the remaining two colors. Do so now. Yellow. Now, once again, I had it on towards the front. Did that influence you anyway, or were you just totally gut reaction? Just went with the first thing that popped in your head. I, in my head, spoke for him when he told me to do it. Oh, I see. So you had that one planned. It was coming. Okay. Now, once again, you can see that I have a piece of paper now. Go ahead and take it out. And of course, I didn't lie to you. There's nothing else in the envelope. Now, this leaves one and only one envelope for yours truly. Now, believe it or not, I'm going to have someone else. Would you just go ahead and hold on to Hold on to my sheet of paper for me. That's perfect. Don't open it yet. Um, as I said, striking, striking revelations. I think you'll be very impressed. Now, you, sir, you uh, you chose the, what, which color envelope again? Blue. Blue. Would you please, for all present, open up and read what's written inside the piece of paper that you are now holding? Wow. You will choose blue. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar impression right after that, and I, and I wrote it down. Please go ahead and open that piece of paper and read aloud what that says. You will choose yellow. Two for two, folks. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep it but I promise I only use my powers for good. Okay, please, would you go ahead now and read aloud what is written on the inside of my envelope? 
Oh. So those women will choose yellow. I will be left with red. Thank you very much. Okay. We're going to try something. I think this is going well. We're going to try... We're going to try to do just a miracle here, okay? Because I really like the feel and the vibe of this audience, the feeling that's going on. So I'm going I'm to try something. I'm going to write an idea that I have down on this sheet of paper. Okay. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll see if this works. I don't know, okay? Now... Um, you, sir, would you mind helping me out? You can stay sitting right where you're at. Yeah, I was, get, I was just getting a good vibe. You, you ready to help me out? Okay, now, on the other side of this tablet, I have written a word. Now, this word is used a lot in business. Uh, lawyers, I'm sure, frequently use Certainly, teachers would use this. Um, now, I know you might say yes, but do you have any idea what word is written on the other side of this? We're, we're supposed to be saying no. <laughs> but that was, that, that was good. Not a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, I, I think that's right. I think we'll, uh, I'll go back and read the audience a little bit more. In fact, um, I'm just going to sort of toss this, this ball out, okay? Let's make sure it's good enough. Crunched, okay? And just if it comes near you, just go ahead and grab it, okay? <laughs> you can grab it and hit your hair. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, it, 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 okay. what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I want you to just give me the first thought that pops into your head. Oh my God. Okay? First thought. Um, and then, at the conclusion of this, I'm going to have you toss the ball to the other side of the room, and then and we're going to repeat the process, and I might, I might use you two for the next effect. Okay. Does that sound all right? I need a gut reaction. <laughs> okay. I promise you'll be fine. Now, four plus three is... Seven. Okay. Now, six plus one is... Seven. Okay. Now, five plus two is... Seven. And two plus five is... Seven. Okay, but four plus three is... Seven. Six plus one is... Seven. Name any color now. Blue. Okay, perfect. Now, if you could, just go ahead and toss that over to the other the other side. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd rather not uh, help out, you can go ahead and talk the ball. Otherwise, it's more than, more than welcome. <laughs> Everybody's begging to get up here. <laughs> would, would you like to help? Otherwise, go ahead and give the ball a toss. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> now, if someone is holding a couple of pieces of paper that seconds ago had no idea they'd be holding that piece of paper. You, sir, would you mind if I ask you another series of questions? Again, just, just try to give the quickest response that you can, just a gut reaction, okay? Yeah. All right. Now, six plus one is? Seven. Okay. But four plus three is? Seven. Okay. But five plus two is? Seven. And four plus three is? Seven. And three plus four is? Seven. Okay. Name a vegetable. Uh, cucumber. Cucumber. Perfect. Could you guys go ahead and help me up on stage? Give them a round of applause if they join me. You, sir, wouldn't mind standing right here. And you, sir, if you wouldn't mind standing right here. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Now, cucumber, you like, you like cucumbers? Is that your favorite? Uh, uh, some of my favorite vegetables, but I enjoy them. You enjoy them? <laughs> He's not willing to make a life decision. No. <laughs> he enjoys himself some cucumbers on occasion. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now on this uh, business card, would you want me to keep it? Oh, nice. <laughs> Please hide. Uh, <laughs> now, what I'd like you to do is think of any time of the day and just go ahead and write that on that business card. Just keep it down. Yeah. Yeah. And don't let me see that. Now, you, sir. Um, well, that watch is very nice, and I don't have insurance. So we're going to use my watch. Okay. And what I'd like you to do is just sort of make sure you can spin the dials, make sure that works appropriately. Okay. Okay. Now, you sir, can I have my wallet back? Ah, I know. That's really good. Okay. Now, go ahead. The, 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 this right here, yes. And could I have this? But we're going to steal it away, never to be seen again. Now, have, have you ever done an experiment with extrasensory perception? Uh, well, not that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> not, that he, not that he senses. Well, today, you're going to do it. And I know this might be
like a bit of surprise, but I have gone to great lengths to have the latest in sensory deprivation technology mailed to me. That's you guys, uh, isn't that awesome? I thought it would be pretty excited. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> Do you mind if we try that out? Yeah. Okay, now you're, you're satisfied with the workmanship and the craftsmanship of the watch? It's a lovely watch. <laughs> it's a very lovely watch, he said. Okay, now what I want you to do is go ahead and hold on to the watch face down. Don't, don't, I don't want to influence you in the slightest. And as I said, this is, a, this is a trick in sensory deprivation, right? So I don't want you to use your senses. Uh, there's some assembly required, folks. Please give me a minute. <laughs> Okay, sir? Yeah. I hope you're not you're not scared of the dark. No, no, no. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> no, I'm sorry. I don't I just don't feel right doing that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> assembly required, folks. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> now, you have, let me see the watch, make sure you still got that. Oh, not look at it too much. <laughs> now, what I want you to do is just make sure that you can spin the dial. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, should, I, should, I should explain the rules of the sensory deprivation chamber. Now that this young man is locked within the sensory deprivation chamber, he may go mad with insanity if we don't carry through with this effect rather quickly. Now, now, this young name is Adam. Now, this is absolutely imperative. Adam, can you hear me? Yes. No response. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I, I, want, I really want to, I really want to stress the severity of the situation that we're in here. Okay. Now, you're concentrating on this time of day. Is that correct? Now I am. Now, I'm speaking directly to Adam's mind right now. But in order for you guys not to get confused, I'm going to say out loud, everything that I communicate to his mind. Does that make sense? <laughs> Adam, please go ahead and shake your head if you can hear me telepathically. <laughs> okay, Adam, now you have spun the dial. That's correct? I didn't spin anything. Okay, go ahead and spin the dial. Anytime you want, go ahead and stop. Now, I'm going to attempt to define what time you're thinking of, and hopefully act as an amplification system for Adam here, so that perhaps Adam can set that watch similar in a similar time as what you're thinking of. Would that be impressive if we were able to do that? And I think it would be very impressive for Adam because he is locked within a sensory deprivation chamber, <laughs> which is which. Much. So you are you are done, Adam. You're competent. I am. Yes. <laughs> Please reveal for everyone standing here today what, what time you broke in. What time are you thinking about? 7.50. 7.50? Yeah. That is amazing because I was getting 7.30, which is very close. Uh, okay. Okay, that's good. Now, let's just see here. Adam, please do not be confused. I'm going to slowly take you out of the sensory deprivation chamber. Oh, Allow the time for your senses to come back to you. Do not move too quickly. <laughs> and how did it feel? <laughs> now, uh, this, the, the, did you get any feeling from the watch at the time that you, uh, when you were spinning the dial? None whatsoever? Felt for spinning it, not really. You felt it spinning. <laughs> okay, I think that's, I don't want to say it was a religious experience, but we experienced something special this day nonetheless. And please read aloud, what, what, what time did you set the watch to? 7.30. A little after 7.30. That's true. It's very close. Good job. Fantastic. Wow. Go ahead and bow your thunderous applause. And, and go ahead and bow. Um, Some students here at the university have recently been doing some experiments in psi. Uh, another term for this is called anomalous cognition. And what it refers to is basically a set of practices where you can uh, use your mind as an extra, extra sensory modality. Same reason that we had to put Adam in the sensory deprivation chamber earlier. We can use our mind to acquire information in new ways. 
Uh, and so I'd like to try and experiment out in style right now, if you guys don't, don't mind. Would that be okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the show is going fantastic. I, I know you guys are so motivated. Let's try it one more time. Are you ready to see a research experiment in style? Yeah. Now, who, who, who here is very skeptical of, of telepathic communication? Who, 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 who's very skeptical? A lot of people, I suppose I'm presenting at a skeptics day, so there should be a good group. Um, would you want to help me out? Sure. Go ahead. Give me a round of applause. Get up on stage. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Come down here and have a seat. Okay. Now, as you can see, it's a very scientific experiment because it says, Psy Research. How much more scientific can you get than that, folks? Now, inside this envelope are some materials that I use when I'm practicing. Ah, you can see there's nothing else in the envelope. Um, but what I do have is a series of cards. Each one of these cards has a different basic uh, design or shape or image on it. Okay? I also have a folded up piece of tinfoil, you see. Inside this piece of tinfoil is one of those images. This one just so happens to be a kite. Now, what I would like you to do is I'm going to scatter these cards on the table and I'm going to turn my back and address the audience. Now at that time, what I would like you to do is select any one of these images, place it face down on the tinfoil, and fold it up. Sound good? What do I do with the rest of the images? You can push them all together if you want. You can sweep them onto the table, uh, onto the floor. Okay. Make sure that I can see them. Are you comfortable with that? I am absolutely comfortable. After you have finished with that, I know you will signal to me with telepathy that you are done, but so that the audience is not confused, please let the audience know when you have completed this process, okay? <laughs> now, while he's doing that, uh, another term for this particular type of demonstration is called remote viewing. And what you can sort of use your third eye, telepathy, all sorts of mental powers to go outside of the skin bag of our body to another location and use your five senses to witness events that are happening there. Okay, have you finished, sir? Yep. Okay, I'm going to come back. Now, Keep that face down. Push. Uh, what I would like you to do, sir, is continue to concentrate on that image. <laughs> <laughs> Hold the sign of search. Now, what I want you to do is don't, don't merely think of whatever was written or, 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 or on that card. Don't merely think of that. I want you to allow yourself to imagine what that symbol might represent. What, what create a story, if you would, in your mind around the image that you're thinking of. Do you, do you feel like the image, you can do that with the image? Okay. Now, here's the rub. It's very difficult to actually tell exactly what image a person is thinking. This is why I ask them to think of sort of vague impressions that he has about this particular object. Because you can pick up on emotions or vague ideas. His body language can give me some indication of whether or not, for example, is it a location? Has he been there before? Is it, is it an item? Has he purchased one himself? These types of very specific details can be transmitted. So I would like you to continue to concentrate on that image. Um, I see, I see a, a, a woman. Does, that, does this make sense so far? Again, don't, 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 don't reveal any information that you feel uncomfortable with, but I'm going to try to check. I see a woman, maybe, maybe a, a tall woman. She's kind of going out of her house, and she's meeting someone somewhere. Does this make sense to you? No. She's not meeting somebody. Maybe maybe somebody was meeting her. I still see this woman. Is there a um is this a this is an oh 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 I know what it is. I see. I see. It's uh is this the type of thing that you might give to someone else? Ooh, um, you see the top one. <laughs> Something around. I see a circle. Is it a car? Hmm. Let me make some notes here. Okay. I I I I'm go ahead. I'm now committed. Um, and again, we have we, we we have the picture. Go ahead and corroborate this. Um, what I see in my mind is an image of a, of a woman, perhaps. Um, going out somewhere and acquiring some thing. But that's about as far as I got. Would you please go ahead and tell everybody now what, what image you're concentrating on? It's okay. Um, <laughs> it was a diamond ring. 
a diamond ring. Uh, and so, sorry, could you please go ahead and lift up that and see what I've written on that? Diamond ring. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. Now bow down. <laughs> anything hooked up before the show, and it was the diamond ring. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to do one more demonstration before we have a little discussion and some Q&A. Um, and there was a book written by the name of Time. Has anybody, uh, has anybody read this? The Time Machine read this? Sorry, The Time Machine, H.G. Wells, anyone? Read that? Very good book. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that in the original manuscript, the Time Machine was really a metaphor for your imagination. And H.G. Wells really believed that you could do anything with proper application of imagination. Um, so I'd like to try a, a little demonstration out on that, if you don't mind. Uh, would somebody like to join me up on stage? Would you, you may have to go on. Oh, she's really excited. Go ahead and come on. Give her a hand. Round of applause. <laughs> now, have you seen it right here? Thank you very much. Um, and your name is? Yeah. Hannah. Nice to meet you, Hannah. I'm Zach. Uh, now, I have here an uh, envelope and a uh, Kennedy half dollar and a uh, business card. What I would like you to do is take this business card and write any year that you'd like, sometime around the time that H.G. Wells might have written his book. Okay? If you don't know the publication yet, that's okay. You can just make up any old number you'd like. Okay? Go ahead and write that on there now. Using what card do you use? That's correct. 1800 sometime. Any year you'd like. Okay, go ahead and slide this card back into the envelope there. Perfection. Now, I'm going to ask you, would you mind licking that for me? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Can I, can I? With your finger? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Now, what I would like you to do is take your hand. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 it's an awkward turtle. It's awkward <laughs> It's only going to get worse. <laughs> what I would like you to do is take your, your left hand, if you would, extend it like so. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this half dollar and I'm going to place it into your hand. Okay? You can keep it face down. I want you to cling to it nice and tight. Okay? Not, not the fact that you're hurting yourself, of course, but not so loose that it falls out. Okay? Now what I would like you to do is close your eyes. I promise this is the, the most contact we'll have. Close your eyes. And what I want you to do is imagine yourself going back in time to the time, perhaps that you even wrote. And I would like you to imagine yourself in an old English countryside, okay? Now you're going to come down off a sweeping grassy hill, and you're going to walk down this hill as the sunlight slowly creeps away behind you. Now you're going to walk down a cobblestone walkway, and you're going to see a gigantic wooden door that's the entrance to a pub. I would like you to walk into that pub, and over on the left-hand side, you're going to see a large rotund man drinking a pint of ale. I would like you to go over to that man. In front of him are some copper English pennies. I would like you to pick up your copper English penny, and I would like you to replace your half dollar where his, Kennedy, where his English penny once was. Now, I want you to walk back out the door, exchanging one for the other, walk all the way back down the road, all the way up the hill, I want you to really imagine the sunlight hitting your face, and now go ahead and open your eyes. Okay, and welcome back. Are you lost in a world of make-believe? <laughs> Good. Now what I would like you to do is please turn over your hands and slowly open your fingers. This is the Copper English Penny, and 1842, is that the year that you traveled to? I don't even remember. Oh. <laughs> 1842? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's magical demonstration. I hope you had a fantastic time and were thoroughly entertained. Um, when I was first asked to come to Darwin Week, uh, I, again, I was really sort of struck with what type of a message do I want to portray about magic? Um, because I've had a really rocky, uh, rocky experiences through my career in magic. Uh, I've been kicked out of a couple of different fraternities because they don't like um, people sort of exposing magic in the way that I do. 
although I don't reveal any actual techniques. Of course, this was all uh, lots and lots of practice, <laughs> even though you might be fooled, when it to be fast. Um, but there's, there's a belief amongst magic fraternity that if people don't have at least an inkling of genuine belief that the supernatural is possible, magic as an art form will lose its appeal. They say that it's not like it's not like playing the piano or art. You know, nobody thinks uh, nowadays that Picasso truly was, you know, uh, divinely inspired and that he did something supernatural. Now we just know that the man was very good at what he did. Um, and so the first question that I would sort of have as a discussion point is, what do you guys do? You feel that's the case? Is it necessary that people truly believe in magic, or at least have an inkling that it's possible, in order for it to be effective? Um, so with that sort of premise in mind, I'm going to go through, I just have a couple quick slides to get us kind of thinking. Um, and I wanted to talk about what I think magic has to say about skepticism, um, why the people at Unify decided to, to have a magician perform quickly, and then I want to talk specifically, very quickly, about the performance art of mentalism, um, and then have a sort of a Q&A session after that. Um, the first thing you'll find is that people sort of throw that term skeptic out all the time. And when I first got into magic, I was told to be very careful who I told that to. Um, because in the mentalism circles, um, very frequently people don't really want to even refer to mentalism as, uh, as not real. Um, and so this can sort of get doors closed for you. And that, that really got me thinking about what is a skeptic and what is a good skeptic. And frequently people sort of interchange these ideas of a cynic, a skeptic, and a nihilist. Um, and for me, I sort of always said, a wise man once said that um, a cynic is irritated by convention, a skeptic is critical of convention, and a nihilist denies that convention exists. That there is. Um, and I think that is kind of a loose, good way of looking at the difference between those three people. Again, at the beginning of the demonstration, I had mentioned that uh, I think defining skepticism as systematic doubt is... A, a very good way of hitting the nail on the head as to what we can do. Um, the next question is, we, we're, we all consider ourselves skeptics here, and we, we like to be very critical thinkers, um, but what is, who can you trust? Uh, I would like to read a list of names right now, and I, as I read the names, some of them you'll know, some of them you might not. I want you to just think to yourself, how are they similar to each other? And more importantly, what is it that makes each one different? Is one or a group of them significantly different than the others? My list name is Nostradamus, Sylvia Brown, James Van Prog, David Copperfield, Zachary Page, Penn and Teller, and Gandhi. Now, I know there were some handsome fellas mentioned in that list. <laughs> distracted for a little while. But what, what's different about these people and what's the same? Now, uh, what you'll find is that these people can kind of be broken up into three categories. Psychics, charlatans, and entertainers. Uh, I gave a demonstration last year that I sort of focused on this distinction. That there are people who, who genuinely have a different way of talking about the world in which we live. And they might emphasize spiritual terminology or spiritual experiences, um, then there are charlatans who blatantly know that what they're doing is trickery. They know that they're lying, they know they're using just tricks uh, and, and technique, but they try to convince people that they're not doing that, that they're using genuine power. And then there's entertainers who, who, who might embody all the other groups, but who frankly don't care. They, they, they just want to present themselves, they want to entertain you for as small amount of time as they, as they possibly can, you know, and, and let you just experience that magic moment. And so, a good place to start is to ask yourself, who am I seeing right now? When, when you see Sylvia Brown, um, you can put her, concept, her, her comments within context when you try to address what is she trying to tell me. If she's speaking to you as a scientist trying to overthrow some scientific worldview, you need to view her comments differently than when she merely sells her book. When she, when she, you know, she might not be wishing to make any scientific claims in her book, and people can kind of conflate those things. Um, of course, magic has enjoyed a uh, unique presence throughout history. I'm sure there are many other professors who will speak this week and talk about different ways that spiritualism has been worked into the 
framework of people's lives. Um, there's a magic book that we even have here at the University of Northern Iowa that is considered the first magic book ever written. Um, and it basically exposes witches and explains that they don't really cut their heads off, they use this elaborate contraption, and they can't really read minds, they use no cards and sleight of hand, and, and such. And there was a backlash even then. People didn't like that type of exposure. And so there's this question of, you guys all knew coming in here that, or, or coming in, I assume most of you were fairly skeptical that I was actually able to do supernatural feats. And I would imagine that even now, you're not quite sure I can do that. Um, uh, another reason that magic has stayed to the background, I think, is a really important thing to talk about, is because there's this requirement that you have secrecy. Um, it's, it's one of the few art forms that has maintained a strict mentorship relationship over, over time. Um, music is the only other very, very, sort of really, really famous um, way of learning a practice that you have to directly learn hands-on from one other person. Um, and a lot of people complain that we've gotten away from this journeyman, craftsman, tradesmanship style of education. And we, we all but have, in favor of large university settings where you can teach a large number of people all at once. And since magic has stayed with that one-on-one -on -one teaching style, it's just more secretive by, by definition, uh, even if they're not trying to do that. <coughs> Um, much as the psychological world was experiencing a cognitive revolution in the 70s and 80s and leading up into the 90s, magic did, uh, sort of uh, witnessed a similar revolution. Uh, after David Blaine performed in the 90s, magic forever changed. He, he had such a weird performance style that nobody had ever seen before. He would literally just go, run up to people and say, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at. You know, if you watch some of his shows, that's really what he's doing. But you're just drawn to this guy because of his skill. Um, and so David Blaine's reliance on what he called just mind-blowing magic really created uh, a, a new paradigm in magic where all of a sudden everybody wanted to do metal. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, some of the, my mentors talk about you could, you could give 250 performances and not one person in that audience would have ever heard of a mentalist or seen anybody do the type of magic you do. Now there's even a main... Uh, primetime television show called The Mentalist, where he claims he can read body language and all sorts of things. Um, Sherlock Holmes, of course, could have been considered the first mentalist. Um, if he wouldn't, if Sir Arthur Conan Doyle hadn't exposed uh, the method behind Sherlock Holmes' revelations at the end of every story, you certainly could have been left uh, with the impression that Sherlock Holmes was psychic. Um, so what is mental, how is mentalism specifically distinguished from other types of um, the basic way is that mentalism is considered illusions of the mind. So it could be as simple as just pulling a rabbit out of the hat, but claiming that you're using your mind to do so, or as elaborate as predicting a newspaper headline, or reading the future, or predicting a lottery headline. So it can really run the gamut in between. Um, psychic entertainment has become very popular. There are so many ghost television shows on right now. People want to have spoon-bending parties. They want to have seances at their house. They want to get tarot card readings. This is where we're really, in the entertainment field especially, there's just a boom for that type of entertainment. Um, very important thing here again, the who's who. You might see Sylvia Brown and Darren Brown on the same television show on two separate days. Both of them are doing psychic impressions, talking to the dead, and, and doing effects similar to mine. But one of them is claiming to be a magician, and one of them is claiming to be a legitimate psychic. And the question is, you know, what are the regulations? And just quite frankly, there are none. You really are left to your own decision making on each of these issues. There is no regulatory body with, for magicians to, to, to claim. Uh, um, the most common example that magicians might do is just give um, a disclaimer. Say, I'm a magician, right? I can give my title of my demonstration a funny little name. I can make jokes about extrasensory perception throughout, throughout the demonstration to sort of give you the illusion that I'm not, you know, that I'm not a real psychic. But other than that, it's all on the individual. Um, and that can be very scary because some magicians can hone their craft so well that it's simply staggering. So my suggestions, of course, are to practice highly systematic doubt. Um, if you see a person on television, you must be aware 
that you're not seeing everything. Um, so, so frequently I'll do a magic show and at the end somebody, there's always somebody who comes up at the end of the show and says, yeah, but I saw David Blaine do this thing. There's no way he could do that. Yeah, but this guy walked on water, but this guy did. There's always kind of that belief that, yeah, I, I know you're, you're using tricks. You, you just studied. You just read some books. You're just using props. You're just doing this, but not this other guy. This other guy, he was way better than you or he, you know, and probably it's possible. <laughs> it's possible, but there are better ones out there. Um, and so, you know, you're kind of left with that, where do we go from here? Um, you and I, I, would, I had hoped to talk about a mentalism demonstration that was supposed to happen at you and I just a few weeks ago, but due to weather, it got canceled. Um, so I had to sort of remove that part of the discussion from, from this lecture. He's going to be back, though, in a few weeks, or a few months, for the to check him out again. Um, but when mentalists come to you and I, they're frequently set upon after their shows by various organizations uh, that um, are either not okay or scared by the demonstrations that they've given or want them to ask questions, you know, psychic questions. And, of course, it, you, you can get a lot more booking if you're um, a little bit more serious in your presentation style, right? Um, and so here is a performer who might have been performing for 20, 30 years set upon by these questions of what should I should I leave my husband, should I leave my wife, what should I do? And I've seen many, many performers, I'm not trying to attack any one performer in particular, but I've seen many, many performers at you and I who when they're confronted with that situation react really badly. They either get uncomfortable and run away, and now here's the scared person who you have just really made uh, feel like the troubles they're having in their marriage might have an alternative solution that's faster. And so to just leave that person hanging is not really ethical, right? Um, so what's the answer? What do we do? Is this just, is it, a, is it a, a minimum number of people? Are there just a few people who can't get it? Or do we have to start requiring more out of our entertainers that they're more honest about the techniques that they're using? So concludes my lecture for today, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions. Very much today. Yes. What does it say in the red envelope in the uh -huh. <laughs> So sure. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the things that uh, and I and I appreciate the question and I do get it. So one of the things that I don't want to specifically answer is of course how how any one particular um, effect might be might be done. Uh, because there are magicians who work tirelessly to create really good material. And when those secrets are exposed, it can really hurt the performance art. Does that, does that make sense? Um, so I'm not really comfortable directly explaining to you, I used this move followed by this move, and then it was covered when you were looking over, you know what I mean? I don't really want to talk too much about those mechanics, other than to say that the real psychology behind these effects it's really just controlling attention, right? Um, waiting for when, when cards drop, um, you know what I mean? It, letting people just sort of experience the magic as it happens. I think that's a much better way of at least sort of keeping the magic alive, but so that you're, you're not exactly sure how it's done, but at least letting you grasp how it can be done. Does this make sense? Is that a satisfying answer? <laughs> not, not really. Not really. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that. Why do you think that there has been a boom in the psychic entertainment recently? Um, well, I think it's just kind of, you know, you could ask the same thing with any boom in the entertainment field. You know, why, why, does, why does rap music become popular when it does for several decades versus the next wave? Um, I think in magic, the 70s is when it really started to get big. And you had things like Yuri Geller went to the Stanford Research Institute, yeah, anyway, he was studies were done on him, proved that he was a psychic. Um, a guy from Cedar Rapids, who I know, was actually the first person ever documented to have psychic powers by the United States government. His name was Stephen Shaw, and he was hired by James Randi to put scientists on. There's a book written about that called Taming of the Poltergeist. So during the 70s, we actually got scientific evidence that psychic phenomena was real and it was being practiced daily. And I really, and of course, it, it, the skeptic would say that they doubt that. In the case of Banachek, of course, he is 
100% was a magician just sort of threw in the crowd. So I think having that background, that created just enough doubt in people's minds, meaning doubt in not believing Psy, that I think the entertainment world was able to capitalize on that type of doubt and, then, and, you know, and really make some new demonstrations that were popular. Um, do you think, or uh, do you know of any empirical studies that have shown that if somebody knows how a magic trick is being done versus don't know how a magic trick is being done, is it less pleasurable to watch a show and say, you know, I mean, I guess there would be trade-offs, but I think it would be just as pleasurable to watch a show and have the same entertainment and say, oh my gosh, I know how he's doing that, that's so cool, that, right. you know, is do people get less entertainment out of knowing how a magic trick is being done? Um, I certainly don't know. Um, I would, of course, be led to think no. Um, a similar question could be, is there a difference in you know, a wine connoisseur's enjoyment of wine versus a layman's uh, enjoyment of wine? And although clearly the wine connoisseur is getting different things out of the wine than the other one, is there really a difference in enjoyment per se, so I would imagine that the analogy would run similarly to that. Um, I do know that, quite frankly, some of the effects won't work if the method is readily in mind. Um, so um, that could certainly be the case. Now, I don't know, if, and you'd have to assume if the trick doesn't work, it's considerably less entertaining. So in that regard, um, there would be that. With the uh, math thing that you're doing with the numbers, uh, Yes, you were asking people to add things really quickly. Oh, yeah. Uh, to get them on their feet and to think this instant reaction right. type thing. Uh, what, are the, what are the common answers? Like, I'm assuming you have like a set of like really common answers that people have for those things. Uh -huh. uh, what is the, what's the common answer for the number thing? Like, what is it, is it dependent on gender? Is it dependent on. Uh, um, yeah. Um, it's dependent on a lot of things. Okay. Um, and I. I think, although I've forgotten now, that there might be another professor who's either talking about that or just talked about it recently. Dr. Matlin mentioned about, did a lecture recently about how the brain lies. And, the, and so, in that regard, you're wondering, is there any systematic way that the brain lies such that you can deceive it into giving you this information? And, yeah, you can use demographic information. Um, certainly men are going to have a tendency to say different colors than women are. Um, uh, women are going to think, it might, might, and, and again, this is going to be very dependent on culture that the person's raised in. Um, and so, um, you'd want to do that, is do those studies in advance. And of course, there are magicians who have done those studies. They ask people, find out. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, some examples are, um, I'm trying to decide on the fly, and I wasn't expecting to ask that question, how much, um, you know, I'm, comfortable revealing all about that. And I think the, I, the general idea is blue is a common color for men. Um, I think a much better way to do it is think of, ask yourself a bunch of easy questions and see what pops into your head first. And I wouldn't be surprised if you were strikingly dead on with what research would show. Because you know? if the research is good, then that's what most people should think. So if you just, you know, name a vegetable, what's the first one that comes to your mind? <coughs> I get it. Um, so I think you're, you're right to that. There's this innocence that 
you could do, you know, you could hold a card just right in front of their face and just flick it and turn it from a two of spades to a seven of spades, and they might go, oh, that's, that's, I want to do that. You know, so there's kind of a not really grasping, in particular, for mentalism demonstrations. Obviously, uh, the deck memorization of sex wouldn't, wouldn't look particularly interesting to a seven year old. So I think you're, I think you're exactly right. Um. All right, let's uh, thank Zach. We're out of time for questions.